Hello and welcome. I'm Megan Alston, a project archivist with the Southern Historical Collection at Wilson Special Collections Library. And on behalf of um, University Libraries, we are delighted to welcome you here to this virtual event. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank um, our co-sponsor, the Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship for Diversity, Inclusion, and Cultural Heritage at Rare Book School. I'd also like to thank our university librarian, Maria Storino, for her support. Um, the entire Southern Historical Collection, especially my colleague, Katie O'Neill. Um, <laughs> our department is keenly interested in documenting Black families. So we are so pleased to be able to spend this time discussing the importance and the impact of these collections and stories. Um, on a logistics note, um, if you have any questions during the panel, please submit them through the Q&A box. And with that, I'd like to welcome all of our participants and turn the program over to our moderator, Alexandra Odom. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to have the wonderful opportunity to moderate this discussion and talk with all of these amazing women as we um, kind of continue with this panel. So I just wanted to do some brief introductions. Of course, we have an amazing group of scholars here with us today. And so just to kind of give you an overview of the amazing work that they've all done. So Dr. Brandy Bremer is the Moorhead Kane Alumni Associate Professor in the Department of African, African American and Diaspora Studies here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research recovers poor and working class black women's social justice vision and battles for citizenship during the 19th century. She's the author of Claiming Union Widowhood, Race, Respectability and Poverty in the Post-Emancipation South, which received the honorable mention for the ABWH Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Book Award for the best book in African-American women's history. Her scholarly articles have appeared in the Journal of Southern History and the Journal of the Civil War Era. Prior to joining the faculty at UNC Chapel Hill, she taught in the Department at the history of, uh, Department of History at Morgan State University and Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Bremer holds an MA in African American Studies and a PhD in University a PhD in History from the University of California. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bremer. Dr. Ken B. C. Phillips is the inaugural director of Library Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Brown University. Prior to her appointment at Brown, Dr. Phillips served as the Joanna Marie Frankel Curator for Race and Ethnicity at Harvard Schlesinger Library. While there, she led the library's efforts to diversify the collection and to be more exclusive of racial and ethnic populations across the country. She's worked with archivists and curators both within the Harvard Library and other repositories to develop partnerships to increase access to collections about marginalized people, particularly women. Dr. Phillips has also served as an assistant curator of manuscripts at Howard University's Moreland Spingham Research Center and has worked with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission as a historian. Dr. Phillips holds a master's in public history and a doctorate in U.S. history from Howard University. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Phillips. Holly Smith is the college archivist at Spelman College. She received her bachelor's degree in history and black studies from the College of William and Mary and an MA in history from Yale University and an MS in library and information science from Simmons College. She co-authored the article, This Black Woman's Work, Exploring Archival Projects That Embrace the Identity of the Memory Worker, and authored the pieces Radical Love, Documenting Underrepresented Communities Using Principles of Radical Empathy as well as Wholeness is No Trifling Matter, Black Feminist Archival Practice and the Spelman College Archives. She is passionate about community archives and archival advocacy related to collections for historically underdocumented communities. Thank you so much for joining us. And finally, Dr. Pamela N. Walker, is an assistant professor of history at Texas A&M University, San Antonio. She received her doctorate in African-American and women's history from Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She also has an MA in history from the University of New Orleans and a BA from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. The grandchild and daughter of rural Mississippians, she was led to study history by asking questions about the origins of the fabric scraps in her grandmother's apron. Her work examines motherhood, race, activism, benevolence, ideas about the South, and political consciousness in the 1960s era social movement networks. 
She is currently working on a book titled Science Still Delivered, How Black and White Mothers Used the Box Project and the Postal System to Fight Hunger and Feed the Mississippi Freedom Movement, which tells new and illuminating story of ordinary black and white women's overlooked participation in the modern civil rights movement using one of the nation's largest federal agencies, the US Postal System. She has contributed co-written articles to three volumes of the award-winning Scarlet and Black Project at Rutgers University, and her article on Mississippi mothers, the welfare state, and the postal system will be published later this year in Gender and History. Her work has been supported by the Mellon Foundation, the American Philosophical Society, the PEO Sisterhood, and the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome. So I wanted to kind of start off with some broader general questions, um, because a lot of our audience might not necessarily have um, quite a rich background in thinking about or talking about archival history um, or even researching in archives, especially as it's related to African American families. So I wanted to kind of open up with a few general questions. So I invite anyone to kind of jump in. What role does the personal family archive play in understanding Black history and culture in America? And even before we get into that, what are family archives? What do they consist of and where can the archive exist? So let's start there. What are family archives? Where can people find them and how do they typically exist? Um, I, I can jump in. <laughs> um, so so um, first of all, thank you for the generous introduction. And it's important because um, the way I approach archives is through the lens of a historian. And so for me, I have to, uh, and I'm a 19th century historian of African-American um, families. And so what that means is that I have to even step back, I mean, and even ask the question that you're asking and say, where, where are the family matters of Black people, both free and enslaved, you know, where, where can they be found? And what I find in the 19th century is that uh, particularly for, um, you know, enslaved, impoverished people is that they are oftentimes in, in legal court, right? They're, they're in unexpected places, I should say. Um, they're in, they're, they're oftentimes in legal documents. Um, they're oftentimes, sometimes scattered across newspapers, runaway advertisements, sale ads sometimes. So oftentimes, um, for, for me, I have to really do a bit of patchwork um, and really sort of collect material in a, a lot of broad spaces. Um, and so um, I, I guess for me as well, I would say they're very, they can be very public, but they can also be very much um, embedded in um, the papers of um, families who enslave people, right? And so, so uh, oftentimes, um, I'm looking through the letters of, of uh, former enslavers who, or enslavers who are talking about their everyday sort of life matters, but then there, they, there may be some, some notes about um, a domestic or a sale or addressing some sort of debt. And for me, that's where I begin to piece together those, those archives. I can jump in. Um, uh, I do a lot of my work on 20th century history and histories of Black women's experiences during the civil rights movement. And so um, one way that I've been thinking about my work is how are these women speaking about their perspectives, not from the perspective of those activists who came down to Mississippi, not from the perspective of folks who were coming down to either you know, investigate the situation or do research on the, um, the movement during this per period, not from the perspective of government workers who were attempting to analyze poverty during this time, but how were Black women describing and discussing their experiences. And so um, that has led me to correspondence um, from women who were engaging in anti-poverty projects um, with outsiders, folks who were sympathetic to the movement, um, folks who were um, interested in kind of connecting with the civil rights movement from outside. And so I found this anti-poverty project that um, produced hundreds of letters from rural Black women and mothers um, who were living in rural Mississippi who were, um, you know, unlettered, you know, informally educated women, but were communicating their day daily lives. And so a part of the work for me has been kind of thinking about you know, what were some of the experiences these women faced? 
What were some of their primary goals? We understand that voting rights and access to the ballot box was crucial, but Black women are also speaking about um, you know, sending their children to school. They're speaking about their labor conditions. And so epistolary correspondence has been a primary um, aspect for me, but we've also, um, I've also found uh, the voice of women, Black women speaking about their families um, and letters that they wrote to labor offices um, and letters that they wrote to government officials. One of the women from the work that I do wrote letters to, to the president asking, for food for their children and better job and labor opportunities in the Delta. And the work that these women, you know, the, I kind of argue in a lot of my work that their lives have often been the kind of backdrop to civil rights, that um, they were the muses of the movement and the reason why many folks came down to Mississippi. But I think that their voices and the ways that they're advocating for themselves um, through their correspondence, through the ways that they're attempting to reach out to powerful people, um, speak to a kind of broader work that these women are doing as a way to kind of create opportunities for their children and their families. And so um, correspondence is one way. I also um, have done some oral history, but I'll pause there and, and um, bring other folks in. Um, again, thank you so much again, Alexander for that a very kind introduction and a huge thank you to Megan for the invitation and um, Katie for the organization. Delighted to be here with um, other wonderful colleagues and friends. Um, so to the question, uh, you know, when we think of family archives or just thinking of archives in general, certainly kind of thinking of the ways historically our communities have been you know, marginalized and oppressed sometimes from leaving physical written or what we think of archives in the traditional space. Um, I, I like to tend toward kind of a, a broad view too, as, as my um, colleagues have mentioned about what we even consider archival. Um, so even in our family, we have letters and diaries and, you know, family Bibles, but even um, I was fortunate enough to know my grandparents into my 30s and they we speak about the embodied archive when we have to embody our experiences and memories, especially for um, communities of the global majority that have uh, traditionally suffered oppression and erasure or marginalization, um, like community of the excuse me communities of the African diaspora. So, even the the living entity of my grandparents, you know, the memories that they have, and thankfully that I was able to share and translate. Um, and I think, not to say the archives exist everywhere and nowhere, but <laughs> I think one of the things I really like uh, about being at Spelman and working with students um, is seeing them get excited to see them themselves reflected in the archives here at Spelman, um, particularly around Black pe women, Black people. So just allowing the expansion of the thought of, you know, traditional kind of archival spaces, even at, you know, an HBCU, we're fortunate enough that we don't have to justify why Black women and Black people are important, but even expanding the notion um, of what constitute archives and, and memory, just to, uh, to broaden the idea of, and to be more participatory and inclusive when we talk about, you know, families. So even thinking of, you know, specific, you know, blood families, but even thinking of com fam communities as families or a chosen family and, you know, what kind of re physical records or memory records um, can be. So just kind of a expansive view that includes physical items, bodies, but memory. Um, I will add, um, and thank you, um, and my co-panelists, thank you for putting this important conversation together and bringing us together to have this discussion. Um, and I'm truly grateful and honored to be speaking with these wonderful women um, about this about this topic um, and the work that they do. And I'm sorry I missed some of what um, Holly you were saying because my internet is spotty, and I apologize. But I would echo what I think I 
what I think I heard you say, and also echo what our, um, our other co-panelists said, um, you know, when you think in terms of family and family records, we find ourselves where, wherever we are. And so sometimes we're in the midst of other family records. Like you can go into the quote, traditional family records of those longstanding and prominent white families and find black families there. You can go into newspapers, particularly the black newspaper network that was absolutely um, uh, invaluable in documenting the lives and stories and experiences of Black people over time and continues to do so. In church and other organizational records, you will find Black families, particularly Black women who are very, very active in those kind of civic and communal um, organizations, how they're doing that work. And then as I think I heard Holly say, in, in terms of how we document family, it was it's a kind of a pushback in terms of who is family. So is it that quote unquote nuclear family where there's two parents and 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 two two point five or one point five whatever the statistic is for children. Um, but who are family? So is it your sister, your mother, your grandmother, your neighbor, that child that you adopted, but nobody knows is not quote unquote blood related, but that is still part of the family. And so how do we incorporate those things and keep those things? Um, and so it's absolutely everywhere. And it's in, um, as um, uh, Dr. Walker said, it's in those government records, but it's also in those organizations and it's in those um, repositories that are open for the public. Also they're in private hands and private places on their way, hopefully to being able to be um, um, investigated by the public. Um, and then also it's just kind of in, in hidden places. So you can find those records everywhere. We're all in all kind of unexpected places. Oh, and finally, oral history, right? Which is, you, you, you can't talk about Black history without talking about the oral tradition. Great, thank you all so much um, for kind of giving us a better understanding of where we're finding these documents and where the histories of Black families exist. So I have a question for you, Dr. Walker, which kind of ties into a question that we've gotten from the audience. And the questions from the audience was about, as a non-university student, someone who's kind of looking to find information about their own family, what kind of resources are there out there for people who are just a part of the general public, right? Who may not have access to some of these university channels, but I wanted to ask you this question specifically because I know that you work with the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum, right? And so I wanted to know if any of your work with this particular community organizations or any other community organizations has changed your ideas about what the potential is for individuals and groups outside of the university and traditional archives um, to explore different kinds of family archives um, and preserve family histories? Sure, and I, I think this, this question actually kind of allows me to talk a little bit about some of the oral history work that SACAM does and how it brings the community into the practice of preserving Black history and <clears throat> being a part of the kind of um, the curation of Black history um, and also the, the storytelling aspect. And so SACAM is a community archive here. Um, it does not have a kind of, um, it has a formal exhibit space that's small, but their investment is in bringing the community into the practice of storytelling. And so one of their main um, goals is, um, or one of the main projects that they do here locally is History Harvest. Um, they post up at um, various churches around the community um, to do this work of inviting the community in to tell their family stories. And generally when those types of events happen, family members will bring um, their Bibles as someone, someone has mentioned. Um, they'll bring um, photo albums, funeral programs, um, various types of ephemera that tell not just um, an individual family story, but this kind of broader community narrative. And so I think projects like this are an invitation to the community to say that, you know, as ordinary people who exist and live in this neighborhood, your story uh, matters and is incredibly valuable. And it's something that um, SACAM, generally what they do is they don't, you know, take the materials necessarily, but they try to scan um, or document the materials in some other way as a way to, you know, preserve the image 
but not remove it, um, remove those materials from their kind of family's home. And there's a similar project here that I'm in partnership with, with uh, the San Antonio Archive is the Office of Historic Preservation. We have Saturday storytelling at this historic black library in town. And we invite members um, of this historically black neighborhood to come to this um, space and tell their family stories. Um, folks bring quilts, um, folks bring um, images, historic images of black cowboys and their families. And this is often a way for once someone starts to share, another person's family history is sparked by that. And so it becomes this community event that allows um, everyone in these areas to kind of share in that storytelling and to be affirmed in that storytelling um, and the value of, of individuals' um, narratives. And so I think community archives like SACAM, um, while they're kind of connected to the university, um, there are no barriers to entry. Um, it is this kind of invitation that exists within the local community and not the university. And so there's this emphasis on um, being out where the people are and the history is to ensure that people feel welcome to come and share their narratives. Great, thank you so much. And so for those of you who have done work within um, the state of North Carolina, and I'm thinking specifically about your work, Dr. Smith, what kind of similar community organizations or community archives have you seen in the state? I know a lot of our viewers are part of the UNC community or just um, residents of North Carolina at large, and they too were really interested in kind of finding these stories and finding ways to delve into African American history more locally. So what are some of the more local community projects and organizations that you think can really be a rich source um, of archival material for those who may be interested. That was me. Thank you, <laughs> Alexander. Excuse me. Um, so when I was at um, UNC Chapel Hill and had the pleasure of working with some wonderful colleagues, I think what kind of kicked off what became known as the Black Families um, Archival Initiative was initially uh, connecting with um, a dear colleague and friend, Dr. Reginald Hildebrand, who taught at um, UNC Chapel Hill with Miss um, Yvonne Holly. And I just want to give much love and appreciation to Miss Holly for being just a wonderful collaborator, supporter of the archives, and supporter of students. Um, and, you know, in terms of supporting Black family initiatives, Miss Holly came from a um, well-known, uh, comes from a well-known Black family in Raleigh. Um, now her father, Mr. J.D. Lewis, was, I, I can't quite recall Mr. Lewis was the first broadcaster on one of the local news stations or an early uh, Black newscaster, but regardless, he was really influential and impactful in the um, community. And he also also hosted a show which televised in uh, early North, uh, North Carolina, parts of Virginia, um, called Teen Frolics. It was a teen dance show. <laughs> and so when Dr. Hildebrand had connected with Miss e uh, Yvonne, and she was telling us these stories and the connections with her mother and grandparents, um, grandfather going to Morehouse, and we were very excited. And she was like, well, are these tapes and, you know, these old transcripts and these yearbooks, is that of interest? And we were like, absolutely. <laughs> so with that being said, um, it was through connecting with uh, Ms. Holly, um, and that was specifically talking about partnering with her to uh, preserve the Lewis family materials. But it was really Ms. Holly who had the excitement and wanted to connect with other families that lived. And um, Ms. Holly lived in a uh, Black neighborhood built by um, a Black architect um, and close to St. Augustine, forgive my memory, I'm forgetting um, the architect's name right now, but it, it was a, a story about the Lewis family, but these broader families as well. Um, so I think with that and, and that excitement and building again, that connection and collaboration with Miss Yvonne Hyde, that led to um, exactly what Dr. Walker, Dr. Brimmer, and Dr. Uh, Phillips were saying about 
connections in the community being the most important because that led to connection with Miss um, Holly's churches, other um, uh, families in the area. And, and I should mention importantly, the, the conversation was about collaborating, collaborating, you know, to document the collections, not exactly like Dr. Walker was saying, let's extract collections because we know what's best in terms of preservation. And that's something I found can be a challenge in our profession, this idea of extraction. And we have the knowledge and expertise as archivists. We do have some, but people are the expert in their own experiences. And it needs to be an equitable collaboration, not me coming in um, as, as some sort of savior. Because we know it, just because I'm a Black woman doesn't mean I can't perpetuate white supremacy. So I can do that too. So being mindful. So Alexander, forgive me, I feel like I'm going all around the bend with your question, but it just makes me think about, um, and in, while in North Carolina, we also were able to connect and, and support and have conversation with um, wonderful uh, labor rights organization, uh, Black Workers for Justice. So it just makes me think for people who want to be involved and support, particularly in North Carolina, but broadly, um, I think as Dr. Walker, Walker mentioned local libraries, particularly branches in historic Black neighborhoods or broadly, are good places, a points of connection. Sometimes they will have a genealogy room or a trained genealogist. Um, I'm from Virginia, and I know we have a genealogy room in Hampton. Um, and I feel like generally people in our profession can be nice and welcoming. <laughs> But also thinking of chapters and branches of the African American Genealogical Association. Um, but when in North Carolina and in Atlanta, just being and being able to be connected to with Black recreational spaces like parks, um, parks and rec organization. And if there are any, I feel like, you know, just making your, you know, being able to go and be present at events in the community, connecting with elders or people you'll be able to connect in those ways. So I'll stop there so others can help. <laughs> I won't go on, but that's a great question. I'm happy to elaborate further if it's helpful. And actually, Dr. Smith, you brought up a really great point, right? Like this idea that just because we are African-American scholars, that doesn't necessarily mean that we um, are immune to kind of perpetuating these ideas of white supremacy. We're not immune to being accused of kind of extracting these stories from the community and not really giving them the same access to that story or kind of taking ownership of stories that are not our own, especially when we're working in Black communities that we're not native to, right? Um, and among this panel, we have a ton of great great big world-renowned um, organizations represented, right? Uh, Dr. Walker, you graduated from Yale. Dr. Phillips, you've been at Howard. You've been at Harvard. You're now at Brown. Um, Dr. Brimmer and Dr. Smith, you've all worked at Spelman. And I think, Dr. Phillips, since you are currently in um, a role as a director, I kind of wanted to start with you and ask the question, have you all kind of seen a difference in the ways that communities interact with or that even universities interact with Black communities when it comes to working with HBCUs? HBCUs and working with PWIs, but then if I also have the opportunity to tie in an audience question, their question is about, is there a push to diversify these archives and to talk about these archives outside of Black History Month, right? So even like depending on the organization that you've been at or the kind of institution that you're at, one, do you see differences in the way that they interact with the community? But two, do you see differences in the way that these initiatives are being pushed year round and not just as like, oh, it's Black History Month, and this is when we're going to talk about all the Black things, and then the other 11 months of the year, it's kind of tucked away. And I did want to bring that up since that was an audience question. So like I said, Dr. Phillips, I wanted to start with you, but then of course afterwards open it up to the rest of the panel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for that question that has so many layers. I'm thinking of so many different things and ways to respond. And the first thing I want to say, which is probably um unexpected answer, is that, you know, Black History Month was not designed to be the one time that we talk about Black history. It was actually designed to be the one time that we celebrate the things that we learned throughout the year. So it wasn't an excuse to like compact our education around Black history into these generally 28 days and every now and then 29 days. Um, it was a time to celebrate those things that we've been talking about throughout the year. And somehow, in some way, 
we as a society got the thing turned around. And so we only tend to talk about Black history in this time when it was actually designed to be done in the exact opposite. So I would encourage everyone to kind of push that narrative and that kind of positioning around Black History Month. This is the time to celebrate the things that we've discovered, that we've uncovered, that we've learned and we've engaged in throughout the year. That being said, I would say we are in a moment where all institutions, well, I would say HBCUs tend to talk about Black history all the time. It's in the DNA, it's in the roots, and generally they talk about Black history all the time, even in those what we call HBCUs that are rooted in, in what was called classical or traditional education, which is to say was rooted in white supremacist theory and white supremacist ideology. Those HBCUs exist, but I think in by in, in today, the most and all HBCUs spend their time throughout the year engaging in a kind of Black perspective around the things that they teach, learn, and engage, and engaging with their student populations in that way. And I think that's absolutely excellent. And I would say that there is a push in the universities that I've been at, um, Harvard and Brown, in terms of being more engaging throughout the year and not limiting what we do um, to just this one month. And I would say not just for for um, engagement around Black people, but engagement around all people, all groups who've been marginalized in these spaces. So there's an in interest to talk about women in more than just March, and we're going to kind of highlight and cap in March and other places and talking about talking about Indigenous and Native peoples in more than just November. Like we want to talk about it more, but it's not um, as natural, I would say. Um, it is kind of a push and there are some people who are pushing. I wouldn't say that there are people who are resisting, but when it's some when it's changed, you tend to lean on the thing that you're accustomed to. So there are some folks who are not, you know, running towards that engagement every single day of the year, but there are folks who are trying and I do see initiatives. I do see more DEI officers. I do see more programming. I do see um, the hiring of staff um, that is specialized in understanding and, and studying folks that have traditionally been, traditionally been marginalized and highlighting their work. Um, and so it is happening, it's happening fairly slowly, but it, but it is happening. And I'll stop there. I, I can jump in to, to speak a little bit about, you know, where the push is coming from and I can, speak a little bit from my experience as a graduate student at Rutgers. Um, while I was there, there was a big um, 250th anniversary of the university. Um, and after kind of seeing all the commemorations, undergraduate students were kind of looking around saying, what about the history of Black students at Rutgers? And so that opened up a, a larger project where we were then doing a history of Black communities in New Brunswick and marginalized communities in New Brunswick. Much of that push was driven by the history department um, and advocating for the chancellor to lend money and finances and support for researchers to do this work. Um, the Rutgers and Black women faculty within that, that program, Marisa, historian Marisa Fuentes and Deborah Gray White, and so I think their work um, advocating um, and kind of being that bridge between the students and the administration, fighting for that type of funding, but also broadening that research beyond the university to investigating the history of Black folks in the local community that the university um, exists within, and then building partnerships with churches and neighborhoods. And so one of the projects born from this from this push that was driven by students was a partnership with one of the oldest churches um, in New Brunswick, Mount Zion AME. And I worked with this church. Um, they had a lot of family history, but also kind of neighborhood and community history. They were founded in 1827. And um, they had a history reading room um, that was had a number of files and community records. Um, and we, you know, utilizing university funding, um, work with them to digitize their materials. And um, we were, me and a team of other graduate students at the time worked to, you know, help create finding aids. The goal was never again to remove those materials from the location in which they were housed, but to create, um, you know, with this kind of institutional money, 
um, to create um, uh, accessible materials that were available online, but also eventually for this church to have a reading room where folks could come look at the materials within that space that was housed. And so I think, you know, part of the work was, um, it's kind of thinking beyond the university, thinking how can we, you know, stretch this opportunity um, to do not just work with it and then university, but to uh, do work within the community and using this, <laughs> this kind of institutional funding um, that the university has to, to push it elsewhere and support um, those kind of the longevity of other community organizations. And then I also wanted to um, ask another question because this is something that has come up in some of our conversations prior to this panel, but then also an audience question. Um, one an audience member said that when they um, think about like the preservation of family archives, they've noticed that it's really common for Black women descendants specifically to be the keepers and preservers of these archives. And they wanted to know if you all could talk about this practice or where you see it come up in your work. But one of the things that um, I always wanted to pose is not only when it comes to the material, but also when it comes to working as an archivist, going through these archives, working as a researcher. I mean, even this panel, right? Like, like this is a panel full of Black women talking about our experiences doing this, right? So there's definitely a gendered component to this. And so how does gender play a role not only in who was preserving these archives and who was the who are the most active participants? Do you see that come up in your work? But then also your experience as researchers and how you have experienced kind of moving throughout this space as well. Um, th this is somewhat particular to my work, and I'll talk more about sort of how I use governmental aid, the records of governmental agencies, pension work, but, but my, my project, um, which does focus on Eastern North Carolina, focuses on um, widows, mothers, and family members of deceased Black soldiers, and so um, they are necessarily um, sort of presenting evidence, talking about family to um, the federal government as applicants. But, but what I also found is that um, these are, again, women formerly enslaved who moved to um, refugee camps during the Civil War, is that they're very much rooted within those sort of refugee communities. And so it's oftentimes women coming forward again and again to reinforce uh, who are keepers of these oral histories that extend well beyond the wartime period. I mean, they're keeping histories of family separation, unification, or reunification um, in times of slavery. Those then become important for their engagement with the, with the government. But I, I think uh, particularly the, the nature of the, the relationship between the applicant and the state in the, in the case that I'm talking about um, is necessarily um, gendered um, in that sense, uh, because it is women sort of um, making claims on, the, on their status and, and proving proving their marital status to the, to the federal government. And that, then that opens up all sorts of other questions. Um, but I would also say just as a, as a researcher going into um, federal archives, um, you know, I mean, it was a really long process. Um, it meant that I had to, um, you know, it's sort of different than community archives in as much, but then again, it isn't, right? I started to build relationships, not only with the archivists themselves, but people working in the reading room, people who were getting me in and out of the archive, people who sat with me when I had to photocopy records and over time building those relationships, those relationships then opened up new material uh, for me. So um, yeah, I would, I would say that, yeah. And I would add um, that record keeping for some reason, especially around family, as Dr. Berman said, is a gendered job. It's gendered in many ways that, and record keeping in the family is kind of gendered in a way that the gender roles are traditionally played in the family. And this just happens to be one that um, 
women kind of largely take control of, as Dr. Berman says, like I'm using these records because who are the people that are going to the doctors? Who are the folks that are, you know, caring for and being caretakers and who who's going to most have use of these this information? Unfortunately or fortunately, it tends to be women. And so those those records and that responsibility, I need this to do this work as part of my function within the family. So I'm keeping the records and my mother did this and my grandmother did this. And so this somehow has become the role of, 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 of the woman largely. But I would say that's not to say that there aren't men who keep records. There are lots of men who built and amassed large collections about themselves and about their work and about their families as well. And if you think about like prominent men like um, Jesse Moreland or, or Schomburg, you know, we have whole centers that have been created around the work of men keeping records. Um, and so it just depends on how you look at it. But I think when you think about the individual family, whose role is it to take care of the family and do those those things where we need records. We need to know who the doctor is. We need to know when someone was born and when someone died and so forth and so on. And that tends to be um, kind of the, the woman's role. And I like to say that maybe that's shifting, um, but traditionally that's kind of how that, how that played out. And just to add on the brand insights from Dr. Brimmer and Dr. Uh, Phillips. So just kind of thinking and coming from a particular framework of working in an archive centered around Black women. In the Spelman Archives, we're actually a component of the Women's Resource and Research Center founded by Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal, a preeminent Black, <laughs> Black woman uh, theorist, you know, who has written on um, countless on, you know, Black feminist theory. And so when I had the um, pleasure to contribute the piece around a particularly a particular practice, uh, seeing in terms of the construction of this archives, but kind of using the framework of the papers of Tony Cave and Barr and uh, Audre Lorde, which we're fortunate to have at Spelman as a way, a situated way of the intentionality of Black women to create a framework of egalitarian documentation for the community and kind of centered in the a Black feminist praxis of thinking about what the, the beautiful statement by the Kambahi River Collective essentially says, when Black women are free, everyone is free. And I feel like even if our, aunts, uh, you know, grandmothers and ancestors, you know, might not necessarily have used the word feminist or even used that term, I think it, it is something inherently feminist and equitable and open to be the, you know, the kind of the arch family, you know, the archivists, the historians. Um, and then, you know, kind of thinking of, you know, the lens and frame of the, you know, what um in the in the um Kambahi River Collective statement, interlocking oppressions of what Dr. Cr uh, Kimberly Crenshaw called intersectionality, understanding how gender and race, but also sexual orientation, gender identity, you know, just the, the many ways that stories can be erased, particularly from historically marginalized. And I think, you know, looking, you know, the people in my own family, you know, but the people that we know, there's an awareness of that. Again, even if you wouldn't call yourself that or, you know, feminist or doing that. So I think with, with that being said, and to exactly to the point, um, uh, can be, I'm sorry, Dr. Phillips, uh, <laughs> that um, Dr. Phillips and Dr. Rim, you know, just made in terms of even if it has fallen out like that, there's a particular power in that and that has just kind of continued. And I see it kind of almost as a inherent feminist practice that, you know, it, it's for us, you know, it could be for your specific nuclear family unit, but it, it's about the documentation of communities and not losing that as well. And, you know, the kind of intentionality of myself, situating myself, yes, I'm an artist, Black woman, I'm a Black from, woman from Virginia. And I know, um, Kimby, you and I have talked about this a lot, some, you know, the fallacy that we're supposed to be neutral, 
in our, you know, I would say we're not neutral keepers of dead records. You know, archivists were very active in, in constructing societal memory. I mean, a collection development statement is a political statement. You're saying what you can and can't take. So it behooves us to understand that there's a particular power in that and how can we essentially use that power for good, not evil, <laughs> but in all seriousness, how we can be more collaborative and equitable and inclusive in our approach. And I think there's a model for that in terms of the way, you know, again, thinking of the matriarchs or black women, or, you know, just people have kind of done that for families, but in communities. And um, not to yeah, be repetitive because everyone has already kind of spoken to about the way that women were often the ones who were kind of at the advocacy offices and things like that. But um, I think because of kind of the way that either the gender labor around the home was constructed, you know, women are often sharing these spaces of storytelling together um, within the kitchen or, or knitting quilts. Um, and that continues today. There's a there's a knitting circle at one of the libraries I was just speaking of that meets every weekend. And so, and they share these kind of community and family stories. And it's often these types of ephemera that are um, either kind of the, these scraps of material kind of um, become these, almost these symbols of the way that women were working to kind of pull together scraps to make a life for their families through their advocacy um, and through their work in the home. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about because I work so closely with letters and you know the women are the primary letter writers in the project that I work on. And it had me also thinking about you know access to education and how um, for many of the women in the Delta, while their education was limited, they they got a couple more years than generally the men in their family. And so that, you know, created greater opportunities for literacy, um, for them to be the kind of main correspondents and record keepers in their family. So I think that's a, a kind of another way to think about why um, women become the kind of, you know, dominant record keepers in, in many spaces. And another thing that I kind of want to talk about, because I think that it's um, going back to something that you said, um, Ms. Smith, about kind of taking these stories. I wanted to talk a little bit about the radical empathy that is involved in handling these kinds of stories, right? Like you said, this is a political statement. This is a powerful statement. It is very important to be thinking about the ethics of that when you're taking people's personal stories, when you're looking at people's family Bibles. Um, but then also, I think that, and thank you to the audience, we've had a lot of really great questions, but some, a theme that I'm kind of seeing in these questions is when we start to look at Black family records, we start to look at very sensitive topics, right? We start to think about um, respectability politics. We start to uncover stories that people might not necessarily want um, to be at the forefront of these archives, or there may be some a sense of shame around some of these stories, things like that, right? So when we're working with these kinds of materials, and especially the materials of Black families, how do, what does it mean to exercise radical empathy in this space? But then what is important, and what do you all think is important to talk about, discuss, and keep at the forefront of my minds when we think about the ethics of handling this kind of archival material. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dr. Kim, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's an honor. I know you're just going to follow up with brilliance anyway. <laughs> um. So thank you, Alexandra, for that question and had the pleasure of um, talking about radical empathy in the archives um, written about by Michelle Caswell, Marika Cypher, and I think they really had kind of wrapped a theory around some practices that, that we had, you know, talked about and discussed and gave a name to a lot of things. So um, radical empathy in the archives is really, instead of kind of like this, exactly like you're saying, this very legalistic way of looking at archives. It's an important what's called a feminist ethics of care. And Dr. Caswell and Dr. Seifert come up with like effective relationships between the person acting in the archival role, but to your point, between communities being represented in the records, communities using the records, um, 
And then of course I'm forgetting the other relationships. <laughs> but when I presented um, some sister colleagues and I presented on this uh, at the 2017 Society of American Archivists Conference, and we also talked about a fifth effective relationship that we have to each other in this field. And basically it's, it's exactly like what you're saying, like working with integrity and care and realizing you have a, a professional, really a moral and personal obligation to consider these different relationships. It, it's like not only with records, but there are people in real communities that are being represented, that are using, that are being affected by them. And one of um, my dear uh, sister colleagues who presented Elvia um, Arroyo Ramirez had talked about working with a particularly difficult collection representing, you know, um, you know it was unfortunately dealt with death and violence and experiencing you know, the loss of a loved one in her own um, personal life and how, and then, you know, just kind of thinking, and I, I talked a little bit about this before, but in here we have had people come in who have lost relatives from cancer and want to see something of Audre Lorde's in the cancer journals. And we were both shedding tears and, you know, I was, you know, it was right recognizing the humanity. So I think with, with that being said, I just think it's, what makes empathy radical is not only when you can have some compassion and understand where somebody is coming from, but then there's actionable efforts behind, <laughs> you know, you're not just saying, I understand how you feel, but you're act actively working to make sure to connect with the humanity of yourself and the people you're working with, but actually make ethical, equitable changes in your archival practice. Um, and I think to your point, Alexander, somebody, I saw maybe a question, a chat pop up. It's like people's right to remember, but also people's right to forget and maybe not to go down a road and recognizing and understanding particular areas of trauma for individuals and communities of recognizing, you know, the, the sacredness of importance of not everyone having access to certain things. And I think about working, you know, with indigenous communities and it's being mindful about ethical care and access and understanding is not a one size fits all. And again, this is where that fallacy of neutrality and objectivity is harmful. And it, it hurts, I think, communities that have suffered particular traumas and marginalization the most. So again, on and on. But <laughs> um, I think, yeah, that has just been really helpful to the, to the practice to remember the, the responsibility that you have, but also not losing your own humanity and forgetting individuals and communities' humanity in the process. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that, Holly. I, you sent me like three other different directions from where I was going to um, start, but I want to say that radical empathy. I remember, um, for example, um, when I was primarily bringing in collections into repositories. I had a conversation with a son whose mother has done some really incredible work, but had developed a cognitive disorder and was not able to engage intellectually with others in the way that she once had and was once well known for. And um, as we're gathering her her papers and her things and getting ready to put them into the repository and you know the whole point of a repository is so that you can have access to the things right so how do you balance the purpose of this the the function of your repository with this this radical empathy this dignity providing for someone else and one of the things that we um had to come to was that these things would not be made available while she was alive because and this was her son's words speaking of the family i don't want to put my mother in a position where someone will attack her and she can't defend herself part of keeping these records and keeping these experiences and telling these stories, there is also an element and a level of protection. And we talk about gatekeeping, that's something else we're talking about, like how and what are we doing to make sure that we are engaged in respect respectfully gathering the stories and respectfully caring for not just the stuff, 
but the experiences and also the individuals connected to those experiences and those stories. And so how do we make sure that we don't get the goal of sharing and the goal of, you know, having these, holding these things and holding these papers and these stories that should not overshadow the responsibility of respecting and caring for those folks who experience the things to create these stories. And I'll say, when you think about all the protection that was reminded as we were talking earlier, um, talk to Kathleen Cleaver, and Holly, tell me if I'm wrong, Kathleen Cleaver, who became the unofficial photographer for the Black Panther Party and who was collecting stories around the Black Panther Party. And she says she started doing that literally to protect the folks in the Panther Party who were being preyed upon by the police, right? So these records are being discovered because there's an element of protection. And then we have these families. And you start talking about not just... Um, when you start talking about adding on the element of immigrant families, I remember um, a president ago, we were talking to immigrant families and it was like, there's a concern about the safety of the individuals as they go now. So we talk about that, that um, the respect that you have to give and that empathy that you have to give, like you literally have sometimes people's lives on the line while you're collecting and gathering and making accessible these experiences. So it is a big, big role and a big responsibility. And I wholeheartedly agree um, with the idea that people do have the right to forget and um, one thing that I do say is like the silences, I saw a question about silences, um, they exist. Nobody knows everything. Um, no, we don't even know everything about ourselves. We certainly can't expect to know everything about our ancestors, but we can gather as much as we can and we can tell those stories with honor and dignity, whether it's trauma or whether it's wonderful joy and love and hopefully it's some combination of the two. Can we, pardon me, Jim, your comment, this is what we just do. We just rip off of each other. I love it. When, your comment made me think of also, particularly like the the work of doc, documenting the now, doc now, um, and also Project Stand that particularly works around, um, Project Stand focuses on working with current and former student activists, and doc now in the past has also worked particularly with activist organizers to document their own work, but also how to be mindful of that work where if you're protesting, you know, that um, the law enforcement could have access to photographs or information, you know, if, if it's posted and use it to prosecute people. So I think in that conversation about making sure that you, you know, can support and let people know about, you know, you want to make things accessible. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of a project, um, a police uh, excuse me, a People's Archive of Police Violence in Cleveland that was done excellently where people from the Cleveland community can upload their own photos, flyers, information. But then when you go to the website, there are some recommendations on ideas of privacy or, you know, certain information you don't have to provide so you can still share a story, share a memory, but you can do so with a, a level of protection and care. And I think, again, that's the responsibility of the archivist to be mindful of the protection and care of individuals. And again, thinking of, you know, knowing unfortunate situations of student activists or activist period who've been doxxed and had to deal with repercussions. Project Stan has an um, uh, activist toolkit <laughs> that student organizers, organizations can use, you know, for documenting their own materials, but be mindful exactly of the safety and ethical concerns, which I think is a wonderful way, you know, to have these conversations like we're having now, balancing exactly, as you say, it can be the, the ethical, but also I feel like the moral responsibility. I know we're not doctors, but do no harm really is, is a good, you know, idea about as you can lead with that, um, particularly. Yeah, and, and one more thing, Alexander, I promise this is it. I just want to bring it back to the family in terms of the trauma, forget for forget and remember. I've you know talked to people who've gone through their family records, their parents have, have passed and they're gone through cleaning out the house and they find out, oh wait, 
So there was an affair here, right? So like you're finding out things about your family, about your parents, about, oh, that's what happened when I was seven. I didn't know, you know, that that's what it was. And so it doesn't have to be so, you know, the the the, the physical threat of police violence or, or, or that physical harm in government into intervention. It could literally be just the emotional trauma and drain of like, I just found out that this is not my biological whatever, or I just found out that my parents had an affair or there was a divorce or there was a separation. And I'm finding out, you know, at 50 years old or 55, and I'm trying to figure out how to work through that. So it, it to bring it back to the family archives, yeah. Which is such an important point because um, I think that when we think about Black history in general, there's so many interesting stories that happen, right? These are such juicy details that really do come up when we start to dig through, especially the personal documents of um, our families. And so as we transition into the audience questions, I definitely want us to be thinking about the future of archival research when it comes to Black families and the future of documenting Black families, because so many of our audience members really do seem to be not only interested in this topic, they've been really engaged in asking questions, but also have a lot of questions about conducting this research on their own. And so the first question that I want to start with in the audience is directed toward Dr. Brimmer. And I think this is a great place to start. Um, this particular audience member is a Barbie descendant, and they're interested in digging through these Barbie papers in the Southern Collection, and they're not really sure where to start. And since you mentioned kind of searching through slave papers, and as a historian, you do a lot of work where you're kind of reading against the grain and finding these um, histories within other documents that might be unsuspecting, what are your recommendations for initiating a search in such vast collections such as this? Yeah, thank you for the, the question. Um, you know, archivists are, are uh, in, in particularly um, at UNC, the reckoning statement and the, the statement about reckoning within the, the library is one of the best I've ever seen. But I say that to say um, that, that they produce incredible finding aids that aren't perfect, that weren't perfect when they were necessarily created, but they are being updated. Um, and so I always start with, with finding aids. Um, I always, um, and, and I will also say that I'm someone who, while I appreciate digital archives, and I think this is also connected to the conversation we were just having about ethics and empathy, right? Because di digital archives, especially now we have Freedmen's Bureau records, uh, a lot of pension records that are just up, but there's a lot of traumatic memories that are in those, those documents that we have to kind of thread through. Um, but, but, you know, I would do a keyword search through the, the, the finding aids. I would literally go into the archives. I mean, once you start to see keywords where you start to see things that start to sound like something might be there, you wanna pull that. But when I'm in the archive um, and I like to go to the archives, I always like to look at well, what's ahead of it and what's behind it. Um, I'm always looking for, you know, maybe I'll, I'll order up a box to get something that I think is there, but I'm always looking around it. And that's something that we lose when we digitize materials um, sometimes. And so I'm a really big fan of doing that. Um, but I'm also a fan of using digital um, tools because I think um, the, the, that to be able to search newspapers in a millisecond now using looking through family names, et cetera, is that all gives you clues as to how to start, particularly in a massive archive like the Southern Historical Collection. Um, and, and also having to grapple with the kind of um, um, traumatic histories, the levels of racism, the kinds of things you're going to encounter. There's a there's a level of self care that has to be taken too as you begin to uncover um, these these stories. So so in a very practical way, um, I always start with the finding aid, and then I sort of back that up with digital tools, and then I go in and I look all around it. Um, yeah. Great. And then um, another question that I want to open up to the group kind of along this same vein of getting people to a point where they feel comfortable kind of navigating these materials. Another audience member has asked a question about are there, are there any suggestions that you all have for training or skill development programs for Black family historians and archivists outside of academia, right? It seems like a lot of our audience members might not necessarily be um, currently associated with a larger educational institution and they're really 
really interested in kind of figuring out how to do this research as someone who is a part of a community that may be in close proximity to these institutions, but might not have the same kind of direct access to these institutional resources, right? So what are your suggestions for um, training or skill development programs for Black family historians who want to what, kind of dig into this work for themselves or to find out more about their own histories? So first, I would um, say there are two national African American genealogical um, associations. There's Afro American Historical and Genealogical Society, and then Holly, you called the other one earlier. I don't want to get the name wrong, and I think you could start with your local. They have local chapters um, in many relatively large cities, um, and I know there's some in, in the South and North Carolina um, for both of these organizations. And so connect with people who are in your community who are doing this work. Um, it's helpful to be in um, community with others so that you can fight off being discouraged and you can also have numbers in terms of approaching organizations to use their resources. Public libraries have a lot, a wealth of records and a wealth of information um, as well, especially if you know, like uh, from this community. So go to your local public library, go to your local government and see your government records. Government records are public. Um, and so go and see what they have in some, in some and a lot of those places, those records are are now or are being digitized. And so they may be able to have access without actually having to physically go into that space. I think getting connected in that way. Also, the National Archives has a great deal of records that are digitized and are available and they have um, sections that are in every state. Like you can you can do, you can do research with NARA all, all over the country. So there are, and, and someone's put also local genealogical societies as well. Um, may have and may be helpful. And I would say, I said, you know, African-American, but if it's not African-American genealogical society, folks who are looking for their history, they'll be able to help you and encourage you to give you tips. And um, um, uh, what's that, what's the religious, is it the Latter Church of Latter-day Saints? Um, has a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful record of, 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 of folks across across race um, throughout the United States um, and across time. So those are some places where you can get started. And I always, always, always encourage folks, if you're at the very, very beginning, please talk to your elders, like talk to the people that you have access to, not just the people in your family, but the people who knew your family, people who are in your community, Mr. and Miss from down the way, they may be able to give you names and give you dates and give you places that you can follow up on and give you somewhere to start so that when you go to um, those those record, those repositories, you're not starting from scratch. And I'll just add too, as far as training on, on some of this work. And a lot of this, as Dr. Phillip has already said, is, is often gonna be localized. So what's available in your communities, but you know, many of these community archives, they run on volunteers. Um, and so, so much of their work, they are um, often small staffed. And so they, they really love it when volunteers from the community come out and help with this work. They do oral history training. And I think having oral historians um, who are coming from the community often mean richer and fuller narratives. And so even that, that type of oral history um, training through these kind of local community archives is really significant. And then um, again, as Dr. Phillips was talking about kind of asking questions of your relatives and elders, um, even kind of thinking about historic family objects and asking a relative to tell, you know, tell me the story of this, of this quilt or, um, or whatever kind of materials or ephemera exist in, in your home can be these rich opportunities and unlock stories or connections or schools or various places that um, I know happens for me every time I go home to Mississippi and have a conversation with an elder in my family. I, I learned stories that I hadn't heard yet. Um, and so I think you know, that curiosity of your family story and conversations with relatives and family friends and um, neighbors and your um, in your home communities can open up doors and opportunities and lead you to into directions for 
um, archives that you might not have considered um, yet. And I'll just follow just, briefly. Oh, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Please. Adding to the wonderful comments already said it, it, you know, just emphasizing that luckily in terms of training to, you know, do oral histories, exactly like um Dr. Walker was saying, and um, like Dr. Brimmer, Dr. Phillips was saying, just outreach for genealogy. The good thing is, um, and of course this determines accessibility to the website, but there are a number of um virtual resources that are available for free. Um, one that comes to mind is the Southern Oral History Program at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, if you were to go to their website, there are a number of um, free resources for guides to doing oral history, even with suggestions on, you know, if equipment, if you can. And I even know, I think StoryCorps might have an app to, um, you, is that right, Can we, Yeah, I think to, to their model for if you would have an, you know, a smartphone or able to do it that way um, in terms exactly like of, of um training and, and resources, the genealogy societies, but also um, like on our website, uh, Spelman, we have a number of resources that have been digitized or available. And I will drop the link to Katie so it can be, thank you, Katie, for sharing these resources so it can be shared out. So even if you're just looking or you have an inkling, maybe you have a relative that went to Spelman um, or Morehouse, it's it was through a grant project that a number of AUC resources have been digitized. So the good thing is sometimes, you know, like places like a Spelman or even a UNC, and I think somebody mentioned the free digital resources that you can even do start some of that searching, like Dr. Brimmer mentioned digitally and still come in, of course, but you can start doing some of the research. I um, also want to emphasize sometimes in, in areas there, like in Atlanta, we have a consortia of archivists who work with Black collections where we do, um, you know, just community support recommendations and that falls into preservation of materials or best tips and practices for preservation or getting started with oral history and digital media. Uh, the Blackivists in Chicago is a wonderful consortia that, again, does excellent work around community support. Um, so I would say, you know, even us, I'm putting everybody on the spot, but we're, we're here and in community. So if you wanted to um, reach out directly, you know, and, and we, we avail ourselves, of, you know, wanting to be support. So we're happy to try to connect you uh, the best ways that you know have. But just wanted to mention um, that in um, exactly like Kenby was saying, the National Archives and the Library um, of Congress and actually, it's some an area of uh, organization called the Northeast Document Conservation Center, which focuses on physical preservations. But they have incredible free leaflets that you can download. And this again is dealing maybe a little bit more specifically with physical preservation. But I, I feel like one, uh, can be I might be wrong, but deals with family collections. So it helps to you know kind of think about exactly like everybody's talking about the resources to do, you know, oral history of the conversation. But if you're also thinking about, you know, physical family materials, there are a number of good resources that can help with that. Yeah, I was gonna um, just add here, um, the wonderful comments just got me thinking that, you know, in addition to, to digital tools, um, you know, oftentimes I just walked communities, but but what that led to is me going to cemeteries. I, I um, the cemetery, the black cemetery in particular, um, so I was looking at a, um, a local black cemetery as well as a national cemetery where um, soldiers were buried, but, but even that, looking at those two spaces just led to questions about, well, why would somebody bury a relative at the national cemetery versus the community cemetery? sometimes spouses were separated um, and it just opened up all these questions. But, but what it also meant is that I, I got a lot of names that weren't necessarily always captured in traditional archives or maybe not in digital, digital collections. But on the question of um, digital collections, um, you know, the Smithsonian um, or the National Museum of African American History and Culture just uh, made available all of the Freedmen's Bureau records um, digitally so you can search those. Ancestry.com has also done the same things. 
th this is really a new day, right? In terms of um, how we access African-American history. And, and as, as new as it is, and as exciting as it is, I think it's just so important to buttress it with a conversation we were having about ethics and empathy. Because I think people are gonna be surprised, um, even if you study these topics, the level of violence that you're gonna see in these records, sometimes it's verbal violence, but oftentimes it's physical uh, violence and trauma that you see in these records. And to really think about how you're approaching it, but also how you're taking care of yourself when you're when you're interacting with the materials. So, yeah. And I'm glad that you brought up cemeteries, Dr. Berman, because we just had um, an audience member actually who had a comment that they've been doing genealogy research for 20 years, and something that they've started to um, do is to ask their elders to kind of diagram out different places of their community, right? So they specifically mentioned apartments and homes before they were born, but also just asking them like, hey, what used to be in this corner? What did this community used to look like? What are some of the places that you frequented, right? I know we talked about the personal nature of a lot of people's stories, but even just having an understanding of the places um, where families are living living and working and spending their time socially can be really important. It can be a really great place to start for those who are looking to kind of get into this history. And um, as we wrap up, I had a final question that I kind of wanted to pose to you. I think um, Dr. Walker and Dr. Berman, this would be a great question for you all to start with. But of course, Ms. Smith and Dr. Phillips, um, if you all can kind of chime in as well. Um, one of the audience members wants to know how your work and personal experience with the Black Family Archives, both as archivist and historian, has shaped your teaching, right? And so Dr. Walker and Dr. Brimmer, you all um, more traditionally are kind of teaching these semester long classes and you are incorporating this into your teaching practices. And so how are you doing that? But then also Dr. Smith and Dr. Phillips, not only just like within the classroom, but is there any kind of um, education that you do at the university level when it comes to library education or archival education? And how are you able to incorporate that into your teaching as well? Sure, I can I can get us started on this one. So, um, and I'll I'll talk a little bit kind of specifically about a specific type of class that I teach. I teach a public history class about once a year where we study um, uh, local history of various locations. I'm currently in San Antonio, and most of my students are from South Texas, and so they also have a kind of local history and a local understanding of of the space. And so um, I taught classes on, um, the class I taught about a year ago was on Green Book locations in San Antonio, places where um, black travelers could find a safe haven. Um, and it was interesting because each of my students kind of got various locations. Most of them were kind of these public spaces. Some of them were black funeral homes. Um, some of them were theaters, nightclubs, um, hotels. Um, and so there were these kind of places that were part of the public landscape. Um, and so much of our work was around kind of thinking about how members of the black community, not those who were just kind of passing through, but really we got this picture of um, like black life and leisure and pleasure in the city. And it gave us a kind of much brighter picture of how black neighborhoods were engaging with one another across the city. And so much of the work that students did was kind of investigating this um, black family funeral home and this funeral home that had been passed down from generation to generation and had autonomy to not only kind of be self-sufficient but could support the civil rights movement and things like that. Um, another student actually reached within her own personal family history regarding um, um, a downtown theater that has since been demolished. So using uh, you know, her grandmother's stories to kind of locate this theater and recover what her grandmother's experience was like visiting this theater. And that also connected her to another, her grandmother was Mexican American, but remembers going to the theater with black Americans and sitting in the balcony. And so um, a lot of students have been reaching within their own personal family histories um, to tell the story about some of these locations that were listed in these kind of public documents. Other students um, 
I think have relied on their grandmother's stories of hearing about some of these funeral homes um, and the, the, the stories that they would hear growing up or the, the advertisement of these um, businesses over the radio. Um, and so this is, it's been really fun for me to kind of, you know, of course, teach students the kind of traditional methods but give them permission and allow them that opportunity to ask questions of their family members who've been here for generations um, and who can remember um, these neighborhoods before they gentrified um, or can kind of tell the stories um, of, of the kind of historic church um, in these various neighborhoods. And so that's been really fun for me as a way for students to pull and their own personal family archives and bring them into the classroom while they're also getting experience with community archives, visiting the traditional kind of Office of Historic Preservation and Conservation Societies and seeing how we can create and write you know, new histories of our communities by pulling all of these pieces together. Um, yeah. I would I would echo um, a lot in terms of what Dr. Walker just said about um, inspiring in the classroom. I mean, right now I'm teaching gender, family, and marriage in African American history and culture. Most of my classes, and I'm relatively new to UNC, but from from day one, most of my classes I have them in the archive, or I have them looking at published primary sources um, to think about why African-American marriage and family matters, right? It's obviously very personal, but it's also very political. Um, and, and to think about how looking at history through this lens opens up questions about citizenship and opens up a range of just a different sort of political questions across the spectrum. And one of the books I'll just say that I'm teaching now, I think is fabulous. Um, um, and, it's, and it's really sort of a window into not only telling a beautiful narrative, but also really walking us through how to read sources against the grain is Heather Williams helped me to find my people. You know, I've got students finishing that up now. And I've taught it before, but I'm, I'm, I'm always so moved by how Dr. Williams is literally walking us through um, how to navigate, in many cases, the Southern Historical Collection. And so my students now are doing that, right? Um, and they're also playing around with digital archives. They're looking at pension records um, and they're having to confront these sort of histories, these stories, and also having to confront the level of detail about Black families that they're, they're um, being immersed in against the grain of, oh, there's silences, you can't track Black family history, it's not there, it's been erased. I mean, this class is really about saying, no, this isn't true. And if we ask questions and if we continue to be curious, not only can we find it, um, but it can open us up to a range of other questions and other histories, so. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what the question was. I'm like, I got so much good information <laughs> just now. Um, but um, um, I'm thinking, you know, one of the things that I think is I've, I've taught in classes and I'm, I'm currently not, but engaged with students and being able to engage in um, fortunate enough to be at Brown where they have a very rich and healthy um what we call pre-college program where we work with high school students as well as students at the collegiate level, but also those students that are coming into the collegiate, that collegiate space. And I also am thinking back to when I started with, you know, this Black History Month being not just to truncate our education, but to actually celebrate what we've done all year, coming from the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which was founded by Carter G. Woodson and was president was um also had the the pleasure of being uh, Mary McLeod Bethune being the president of that organization and those two individuals, um, I kind of, um, I don't want to say model, but I admire what they've done and like to walk in terms of like expanding education from beyond the traditional school setting and making sure that we're talking to communities. And so I'm thinking about um, the association, which was, a, which was founded in 1915, as early as the 1930s was doing 
family genealogical layouts in some of their publications. And they are looking at communities and they're bringing in school-age children, but they're also going into senior areas and talking to across generations about the impact and importance of family and the impact and importance of of, of recognizing and seeing yourself in multiple spaces and places. Um, and so when I think about like, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Woodson having taught at several places, including Howard University, then kind of pull back and say, I'm going to focus mostly on the community and Mary McLeod Bethune actually founding a university, but still was very, very interested in getting that community education and making sure that we're talking across generations and we're talking across gender. Um, I think that 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 is important in terms of incorporating the richness of what family history can do beyond the classroom. I think it's absolutely wonderful um, that we're doing this work in the university because we absolutely need um, new generations of, of, of young people coming in and doing this work and continuing this work and continuing to make sure that this work is, is treated with dignity and respect and making sure that we um, legitimize, for lack of a better word, this work of, of understanding family, but also we need the family. And so um, having that kind of mix and um, the association or SALA being a really great conference or organization that pulls together both the scholarly and the lay person together to do that work and to recognize the importance of family. Um, that's kind of where I land in terms of like making sure that we get it in academia, but also making sure we get it in the community as well. And thank you so much, Dr. Phillips. I think that was a really great way to sum up a lot of the things that we've talked about um, during this conversation. I want to, again, thank all of our panelists. Thank you all for engaging in such a rich discussion. You all brought up such amazing points. It's been wonderful to hear more about your work. It's been wonderful to hear your answers to some of these audience questions. I want to also thank our audience. You all asked some really great questions. We had a lot of great engagement with the audience. Um, and because it was so clear that there are so many audience members who are interested in doing this kind of work and getting into archives, I really do hope that some of the resources that we've talked about and some some of the things that we've kind of sent through in the chat can really be helpful as you all either get into or continue to study Black family archives and um, even document some of your own histories as we move forward. So thank you all again. It's been great moderating this conversation. Thank you so much, Megan, for organizing this. Megan Austin is the brains behind this whole thing. So we're just going to give her a round of applause because she really did put together a great event. And I'm so excited to just say that I was able to be a part of it. So with that being said, as we wrap up, I'm going to go ahead to pass it back over to Megan so she can close this out. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And just to echo what you said, and I think the overall sentiment, this was such an incredible and thoughtful um, panel and the discussion was really amazing. I, I learned so much that I'm hoping to incorporate um, into my work. And as Alexandra said, I'm hoping that, you know, we as researchers and people interested in, in collecting and telling these stories will be able to incorporate in our work. Um, before I leave, I would like to drop um, a resource into the chat. Um, it is a link to um, the Southern Historical Collections Lib Guide on our African American Families Documentation Initiative, which Holly mentioned and was one of the founders of. And it you know gives you an overview of what the initiative is. Um, shows you some of the families that we've documented, so you can get a sense of what those type of collections are made of. Um, and it also shares resources for, you know, preserving your, your documents and your family stories at home, deciding whether or not you'd like to donate them to repositories and other things of that nature. Um, and so with that, um, I think we will conclude the program. And I'd like to thank everyone who attended and also very warmly thank our, our panelists and our moderator, Alexandra, for making this a, a really great program. Thank you.